thought it was exciting coming to church for me. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I think you can turn to Luke. Luke chapter 9. How many of you know faith is a fight? Amen. <laughs> you know, and even though we've been made more than overcomers, it's a fight to enforce the victory. <laughs> you know, back in back in the Garden of Eden. You know, he gave authority to Adam, gave him in the instruction, gave him the job of tending and keeping the garden. Now, that's a real quick summary of what I believe was quite a big job. You know, tend and keep the garden. You know, and when we think about that today, you know. <laughs> We think about a little plot about as big as this uh, <laughs> carpet here, you know. But but the garden he was keeping was bigger, bigger than just plants, bigger than just animals. And part of tending that keeping, tending and keeping that garden was, you know, we don't know how long the fellowship between God and Adam took place. Who knows? Who knows how long it was until Eve came along? Who knows how long it was between having Eve there and the tempter came along? We don't know those time periods, okay? But I know this, that it was his job to tend and keep that garden. And I I don't believe that God sent him in there unprepared. I don't believe God sent him in there not knowing who the enemy was. I don't believe that God just allowed the enemy to come in and wreck everything on a child. You know what I mean? Adam wasn't innocent. He was accountable. He was given a job. And I believe he knew who that enemy was. And I believe he knew what he should have done. And he considered otherwise. And it was his job to kick that serpent out. And in the cartoons I used to see growing up as a kid, you always saw that serpent, you you know, it was always a literal serpent, but he had legs, you know. (laughs) This is the cartoon imagery I had as a kid. You know, there used to be, snakes used to have legs, that's what I believed as a child. (laughs) Snakes used to have legs until God cursed the feet off them. (laughs) Then they had to crawl around, you know. That's not really what happened. See, that serpent was Satan. And he wasn't a physical adversary. He was a spiritual adversary. And he came into that garden. And he said, hath God said. And see, when God cursed him to eat the dust of the earth, was what he did was he put a spiritual restriction on him. And said, look, man's fallen. The authority I've given him has been lost. From this point forward, you're restricted to the dust of the earth, you know. And what that means is as a spiritual authority, you know, you you, you look at some of the spiritual agents in the Old Testament, those those angels that were sent by God, how they went to war. You think about some of the victories they won. That's what what the devil was, was one of those angels. It's no wonder God put a restriction on what he could do. See, because the devil can't just come up and kill you. If he could, you know he would. If he could come up and just push a button and kill you, he would. He hates you that much. But God said, cursed. From this day forward, you're going to eat the dust of the earth. In other words, he's restricted. He cannot use anything but what you see, what you hear. What the physical things, the dust, the elements, he's restricted. And if he was restricted from that point forward and then Jesus came 
that you might have life and life abundantly. See, because we were stuck in spiritual death. We were stuck chained to a nature that was sin. And that nature of sin in Christ has been removed from each and every one of you that have bowed the knee. And so the enemy can't get in there and use that nature anymore. That used to be the enemy's biggest card was that every single person in their innate being, their nature agreed with the enemy. How easy is it to convince you to do what he wants? You're already in agreement with him in here. And so God had to give the law to restrain what was working on the inside of people. But Jesus came that you might have life. Everybody say life. life. And see that life is on the inside of you. And now that nature that's on the inside of you, in spite of your memory and your behavior patterns of the old life, that memory of everything you used to be, but when you get born again, old things are made new. Amen. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. And now my innate nature, who I am in my core, the fruit of my spirit is no longer sin. The fruit of my spirit is no longer hatred or violence, murder, covetousness. That's not the nature of my spirit. That's the nature of the world's spirit. But that's not the nature of my spirit. Well, the nature of my spirit is love, and joy, and peace. And see, the enemy, he has nothing he can do to touch that place. That's the, that's the Holy of Holies. You get that, you know? They didn't come in the right way in the Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament, you die. And they were so concerned about it, they'd wrap a, they'd wrap a bell around your, your, my dad would tell me that, scare me as a kid, you know? <laughs> they'd wrap a bell around your ankle as a priest, if you went in there and you didn't go in there the right way, you didn't go, maybe you had some hidden sin or something like that, you didn't confess beforehand, you go in there, God is not going to allow sin to enter into the Holy Holies. And he's not going to let a devil come into the Holy Holies. And they put that Holy of Holies in there with other idols and <laughs> they come there the next morning, those other idols are down on their faces, you know. See, on the inside of you, you are his child. And he don't let the devil come in there and touch that place. Amen. So what does what the devil got to do? He has to fight with your eyes. And he has to fight with your ears. And uh, it's a fight. But, but it's a fight we can win. And it's not by might. It's not by power. But by his spirit. Everybody in Luke. Luke chapter 9. <laughs> <clears throat> this is such a perfect micro picture of the gospel. This is, you know the mission hasn't changed. Jesus is still wanting his body to preach the kingdom. Still wanting, you know, the church is not a defensive position that we're bunkered down waiting for the devil, you know, his next attack until he comes and rescues us out of here. He's wanting us to beat down the door of every city so the kingdom of God is here. Amen. And we're here to take over. Amen. In love, we're here to take over. <laughs> he expects his church to be victorious, Amen. not waiting. Amen. He expects his church to take authority away from and, and, and set the captives free and declare good news. This is good news that he's brought. Yeah. And what he did here, this is the mission hasn't changed, the picture hasn't changed. This is what he expected of his church. He says, it's expedient that I go away so the Holy Ghost can come and be with each and every one of you. In other words, he didn't want to have to keep thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people having to come to Jesus in the flesh and say, what do I do? <laughs> Wouldn't have worked. But the Holy Ghost can be with each and every one of you. He goes home with you in your homes. He speaks to you. He gives you insight on the problems you're facing. He heals, he restores, amen. And I'm a big believer in getting prayed for. I'm a big believer in, in corporate prayer and, and, and submitting to somebody else's authority in their relationship with God. I'm a big believer in that. But I'm also a big believer in that if there is no one else on earth and you're stuck on an island, you can believe God for yourself amen. because you're his kid, yeah. amen. <clears throat> now look at this picture here. 
Luke 9. And then he called the 12 disciples together and gave them power. Everybody say power. power. And authority. Everybody say authority. authority. Those, are, those are two different things, you know. Okay, power and authority. I could have power with a gun in my hand, but it doesn't mean I have the authority to use it. Okay, power and authority. You can have authority, but not realize you got any power. I mean, that's most of the church right there, okay? Power and authority over all devils. Say all. all. Except for that big one, though. <laughs> Except for Satan himself, you know. I'm pretty sure if the Holy Ghost is involved, it's all. <laughs> Amen. Authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Everybody say cure. cure. Now, I'm telling you, if this is, he has not even gone to the cross yet. This is all, you, anybody ever have a, car, uh, a charge card? Now, don't abuse it, okay? <laughs> but if you, I have a credit card and I try and pay that off every month. And I do that because I get free flights, you know. And Natalie likes to travel, so we got to keep, keep Natalie happy, you know. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. No, that's not a good way to live, is it? No, it's not. Happy God, happy life. That's the way to... God, wife, and me, and the kids, you know. <laughs> that's the order I see things. Anyway, um, I digress. Maybe. Maybe I don't. Maybe some of you need to hear that. <laughs> okay. Bring me back, Lord. I, I let my mind, let my mind run. Charge, yes. Okay, so this is, this is like, you know, when, when Jesus, uh, he's doing all of this thing on authority that's coming through the cross. And when he got baptized by John, he, I believe at the moment he got baptized by John because what baptism is is a symbol of death. And when he went underneath and came back out, I believe he was making a heart commitment right there. I'm going to go all the way with this. I know why I'm here. I know what I'm called to do. My heart is on this, and faith is judged by the heart. Okay? And I believe at that point, that point, he says, you're my son. Now, he was made in his son, okay? But I'm well pleased in what you've said you're going to do. And I'm going all the way with this. And then from that point on, he went doing good, healing all those that were oppressed to the devil on the authority that I'm going to complete this work. See, on the authority that I'm going to the cross. By my stripes, they're going to be healed. By my righteousness, they're going to be made righteous. Okay? And so he's giving them authority. Authority and power. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God, verse 2, and to heal the sick. And these were his instructions. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor script, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. In other words, this trip I'm sending you on, God's going to provide for everything. He's going to show himself strong for you. Okay? And whatsoever house you enter into, there abide and thence depart, and whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel. Was that it? Preaching the gospel? And healing everywhere. Everywhere. They took seriously the commission that this guy, he gave me the authority. I got my papers, I got my badge, and I got the Holy Ghost is coming with me. And the Holy Ghost, through the word of Jesus, was sent to watch over everything they did. And when they prayed, it was as though Jesus himself prayed for those people. This is prior to the cross. This is a micro picture of what the church is supposed to be today. Go and do this. Okay, well, that's just the 12. Okay, you can skip ahead. Look at Luke 10. Now, this is all one picture here, so I, su I suggest you read all the way through this, okay? After, you know, he says Luke 9, he commissions the 12 to go do this, and look at this, Luke 10, verse 1. 
After these things, the Lord appointed other 70. Everybody say 70. 70, 70 also. And, and he did that knowing that many of these would fall away. Okay? 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and every place whither himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great. And these are those verses that the, the modern church loves, but keep it in the context of the picture he did here. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be unto that house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house, and into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. This is, this is part of the gospel. It's not just the message, it's the demonstration. If this is how Jesus expected him, you know, the gates of hell are not set to prevail against you. Because you don't go by yourself. Look at verse 9. And heal the sick that are therein. And he doesn't give any kind of caveats to this statement. Unless, you know, <laughs> unless it's a crazy situation, you know. Unless they're a sinner. He just says heal the sick in there. In other words, I'm getting a message. The kingdom of God is here. And the message hasn't changed. The gospel hasn't changed this is the reality that we're called to awake to as a church. Amen? Amen? Heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your way out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, but you sure of this, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. So the instruction here is this. Look, you go into these cities, you heal their sick, and you say the kingdom of God is here. And then if they kick you out, you can wipe the dust off of your feet because you gave them witness not only of the truth but of God's power. You got, they got no right to expect you. To wipe the dust of feet off of your feet if you haven't shown them the gospel. And this is why the judgment was so severe. Look at this. Look at this, verse 12. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in the day of Sodom, in the day for Sodom, than for that city. Why? There's a greater witness to these people than there was in Sodom. Okay? Woe unto you. Chorazin, woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And now Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despises you hear, despises me. And he that despises me despises him that sent me. And look at this verse 17. No, this isn't just the 12. This is the 70 na nameless ones, you know. The 70. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Amen. What have we lost? What have we lost? You know, I'm, I was reminded, I think it was just this last year, was the 400th anniversary of when um, the gospel of grace got its legs back with Martin Luther. He says, it's not by works, it's by grace that you're saved. And I don't know the precise time period, but I think it's been the last 200 years that mostly that, that 
baptism of the Spirit has been restored to the church. And it's been the last hundred or so years where the church at large now believes mostly. Now they won't, they won't preach healing as, by faith like we do, okay, as, as a majority, but they will at least acknowledge it's possible for God to heal you. You know, these are things that we've gained back. These aren't things that they had 500 years ago. Now, we had them, but the enemy did a good job locking it up. Amen? Amen. He did a good job locking them up, but we're going to recover everything. 100% we are going to recover it. And I don't care if it takes another 100 years, we're going to recover it all. We're going to have what he said we could have. And I'm not going to use where we currently are as a measuring stick for what's possible. Because that's not faith. That's judging things by experience. That's short-sightedness. That's living by your sight. Amen. Amen. And I thank God for those that went before me, even though they didn't believe everything I believed. I thank God that I get to stand on the revelation they brought back to the church. Amen. And look at this. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, I I used to think a while back that that was, you know, in the eons past. But that's talking about right now. That was talking about, I was watching as you went from that city into that city. And he was dethroned in every place. He was dethroned from authority. And light was springing forward in those places. Behold, I, now look at this verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power. Well, he didn't say this just one time, did he? Okay. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents. (laughs) You remember the Garden of Eden? And scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy. Everybody say all. There's no, that's that all word again, all right? And nothing, nothing. He loves these ultimatums. All things are possible, all authority, all power, nothing. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Everybody say me. Me. Have you been hurt? Oh yeah, I've been hurt. But we're getting it back, Amen. amen. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Praise God. I'm not going to mix and compromise the integrity of the gospel with my experiences. I want to obtain what he said I can obtain. And there's a real good picture of that. And and most we, we live our lives and, and, and we, this is the risk we run and this is the power that the enemy could have is that we adjust our believing based on what we see. We adjust, we set our sights lower because of what we've experienced. I thank God the people before me didn't do that. I thank God they stood up and said, you know what, salvation is by grace alone. You can't earn it. I thank God for the people that stood up and said, you know what, the Holy Ghost is for today. Tongues is for today. I thank God for the ones that even though they, they endured their own set of scandals, at least they stood up and said, healing's for today too. Amen? Amen. And there's more than that. You can flip back to Luke chapter 9, 38. Well, what happens when you don't always win? Because faith is a fight, right? Anybody ever lost a fight? Yeah, it's okay. Just get back up and you win the next one. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Matthew 9, or I'm sorry, I said Luke 9, right? All right, Luke 9, verse, uh, we'll start here in verse 38. Now, this is in between those two scenarios. This is in between. He commissioned the 12. He sent them on their way. And then he commissioned the 70 afterwards. But these are particularly the 12. He had commissioned them, given them authority to heal all the sick, to cast out devils. And you know they did it. Amen. But they ran into one that gave them a little bit of trouble along the way. Okay. 
And I've preached on this in years past, but we're, it's good to hit on it again, okay? Look at this, Luke 9, verse 38. And this is part of this commissioning. Jesus had sent them, okay? And in other places in the scriptures, you can see more context to this. We'll, we'll go to Matthew 17 here in a second, but I wanted you to see it in the context of Luke 9 to 10, how this occurred in their commissioning. He gave them all authority, all power. Is that true? Now look at this. Verse 38. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, and foameth again. And bruising him, hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out. Well, they'd been given power for this. They'd been given authority. I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, I feel your pain. <laughs> he got right in there and wallowed with them, you know. <laughs> no, he gave him a solution. <laughs> gave him an answer. All right. And Jesus answered and said, oh, <laughs> oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? And suffer you. And part of the meaning in that is, like, I'm not going to be here forever. There's, you know, one of the questions he asks is, when I return, is there still going to be faith on the earth? You know. Bring thy son here. So the disciples prayed for him, and then Jesus prayed for him. And as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down. And tear him. So now get this. Jesus said come here. And this devil tried to do to Jesus. What he had done to the disciples. He played this card of what you see. Okay. Now this, dev this particular devil. I don't think that these details aren't in here for a re or are in here for a reason. Okay. This one would throw him to the ground. Now this is a picture. If somebody's walking to you. And this devil violently picks him up tosses him to the ground, throws him in the fire, throws him in the water. He's just writhing on the floor, foaming at the mouth. Everything that can be seen is being seen. What's the difference here? Jesus don't care about what he sees. And the disciples were not yet in a place where that circumstance was in a lesser degree than their faith. And he says, bring him here to me. And the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. Now, what was the will of God in that scenario? You know what it was. It was healing. Okay, let's go to Matthew 17. Let's look at the remedy. Everybody say remedy. Matthew 17. <clears throat> this is the same scenario, more detail, okay? Matthew 17, we'll start here in verse 17. So the context you need to remember is Jesus had commissioned them. He'd given them all authority and power, and they'd had success, amen? Amen. They had seen healings. They had seen devils been cast out. <clears throat> verse, we'll start in verse 15. The same father was saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falls into the fire and in the water. And I besought him to thy disciples that they would cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the devil, departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And I always had a pastor tell me, he says, you know why they came to him apart? Because <laughs> if they would have asked him right there in front of everybody, he would have told him right there in front of everybody. <laughs> they already knew, they had enough insight to say, <laughs> well, let's go talk to him afterwards why we couldn't do <laughs> Jesus didn't care who was listening. If you asked in public, you're going to get a public answer. <laughs> and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. 
Now look, look. The fight of faith is not a fight of works. It's not about what you do for God. It's about having faith. It's a fight of faith. It's a fight of working to believe. It's a fight of working to fight off what we see and what we hear. And so oftentimes faith gets relegated to this kind of passive force that says, I'm just trusting in God no matter what happens. Just whatever happens in my life, I'm trusting God and I'm holding on. And you just get beat up by the devil while the storms come and take everything away from you. That's not faith. That's not the faith I see. The faith that I see stands up and says, what is happening is not God's will, and I'm going to contend for God's will in spite of it. I'm going to rewrite what I'm seeing with the word of truth. That's a fight of faith. The fight of faith is not to come to heaven and say, well, I held on to you all my life. I got beat up, but I still believe. That's okay. (laughs) But that's not taking the kingdom. That's not declaring war. That's not kicking down the gates of hell. That's not springing up light everywhere. That's not what he sent us to do. Amen. Because of your unbelief, so the problem, the primary problem was their unbelief. Well, what's the solution? Jesus doesn't give you the problem without giving you the solution. Amen. If he gives you the problem, he gives you the solution. He says this was the problem. It was because of unbelief. And the unbelief of what? It was the unbelief that was manifested because of everything they saw carried a greater weight. Your heart's like this big scale, right? And it gets inflows. It gets inflows from God, your Father, and your spirit. And it gets inflows from the world and your soul and your emotions and what you see and hear. And you, (laughs) whether you like it or not, are the judge of what is happening here. You have that authority. In the same way that God gave Adam authority, there's a reason we're created in his image. You know, part of being made in his image is you have a certain amount of authority. In the same way that God was creator of all, he gave you this place to dress and keep and have authority here. That's part of his image. He's not here to take it away. He's here to restore it. And we're learning what it means to have authority in this place. That as I'm alive right now, I get to judge what gets to stay in my life. That's faith. Amen. He says, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. Everybody say remove. And nothing shall be impossible. In other words, he says, look, forget the devil. Look at that mountain. There was faith. And and, and many times it's made... (laughs) The mustard seed has made the point. He just got through telling them you had, in one place he didn't say unbelief. He says unbelief here, he says because of your little faith. And everybody likes to say, if you just had a little bit of faith. Well, he just said, if little faith was the problem. <laughs> Why is it a mustard seed? Why didn't he just say a grain of sand? If you had faith like a grain of sand. He didn't say that. He said faith like a mustard seed. You look into what a mustard seed can do in a growing season. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't saying just have a little faith. That was the problem. (laughs) He was saying if you had faith like a mustard seed and you, mustard seeds just explode. They just take on whatever environment they're in. Doesn't matter where they get sown, it's gonna blow up. It's gonna, I think, uh, if I remember my research, they grow like something like six feet in a growing season. Crazy growth. That's what I wanna be, crazy growth of faith, amen? Amen. I don't want little faith. I don't want seed faith. I want, I, want, I want exploding faith, all right? That's what he's saying here. If you had faith like, not faith tiny, okay? You have faith as. And then look at this verse 21. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Keep that in the context. What was the primary reason they couldn't cast it out? It was unbelief. The remedy for unbelief. I don't think the devil keeps note on your fasting. <laughs> He keeps note on your faith. And if you are spending time in prayer and spending time in the word and spending time in fasting, there's gonna come a place where you believe his word more than you believe what you're seeing. And that's where faith exercises authority to remove that mountain from your life. And every defeat you suffer 
know that it's just temporary because we're going towards a better country. Amen. And uh, I've, I need to just share it. I just, just because I, I haven't publicly said it, but um, this is, this, we haven't had church these last two weeks, last two Sundays. And I was kind of glad about the first Sunday we missed because the Saturday before we had a miscarriage. Um, and uh, we saw the signs Friday, two weeks, three weeks ago now. And we started getting in there and praying and confessing and did everything we knew to do. And uh, we didn't win that one. But that doesn't mean we're not going to win. And just because emotions, you know, when you go through, you go through those feelings. You know, I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. Feelings of fear and wonder and questions but he gives you the answers for those things too and um, very lovingly he showed me some things he tried to say and I don't need to tell you (laughs) I don't have to tell you that much but it wasn't God's fault that's he's not the author of those things he's not he doesn't set you up to fail you know that He's a good father. And just because you lose a war every once in a while doesn't mean he has changed his plans towards you. And he did everything he could to get it across to me, how to change that. I was just a little busy. (laughs) I was. But I believe that you can run into wars like that and have faith to change them. Medically, they tell you, I know all about miscarriages now, never did before. (laughs) Medically, they tell you once they start, they're impossible. All things are possible to him who believes. And he gave me the wisdom to avoid it. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm glad that that little person exists somewhere. I'll get to meet him, okay? But he's always out there for your good. He has nothing but good for you. You know, life has a way. This is where the enemy works, okay? This will be the last thing I say. You know, I was into photography for a couple years. And uh, and one of the rules of photography is you gotta set your subject, what you're gonna focus on. Because if you set your, you know, if you try and focus on multiple images, your picture's gonna look bad. You're not gonna know. It's going to be confusing. It's not a good picture. But if you get your focus just right on what you're wanting, it's a good picture, you know. And he was showing me. He says, look, you think you've been focused up to this point where we're going. You're going to be so focused. My heart is so set on seeing everything I just talked about. I don't care about anything else. I don't care I don't care about anything else. We're going to have this. And I'll remember the, the defeats. And I'll think, I'm so glad we didn't stop there in camp. Because that's not where we're staying. Amen? Amen? Don't stop pressing into God. And don't let today's defeats be, define your life. You keep pressing forward, amen. Amen. This isn't God, this is me. (laughs) That's okay. It's okay to cry every once in a while, I think. (laughs) Praise God. I'm glad I got to come to church today. It's warm in here, amen. All right. Ah. All right. Father, I thank you that you take your word, which is truth that cannot lie. I know the role you've given us and purpose we're here. 
how much you paid to restore back to us the authority that we lost. We're going to go about doing good. We're going to go about kicking that serpent out of this garden. We're going to have everything you said we can have. And you have given us all authority and all power. And we're going to go forward and the gates of hell will not prevail. And I thank you for 100% ultimate victory in every circumstance that's facing these people. That they have hope that's unshakable, undeniable that cannot be dissuaded by what they see, what they feel, and what they hear. We're going to be a people that truly walks by faith and not by sight. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.